So there's some principles that we, I'm sure we know about. Principles of how to maintain good health and prevent sickness. Why, why should we be concerned about our health? Why is it important? Because in 3 John, chapter, in uh, it's verse 2, 3 John, the third epistle of John, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So we see from this very uh, this very verse that it is indeed God's interest that we prosper. So it is Almighty God's, God's express will and intent that His people be in health and for good reason. Well, it seems that this person, you know, to, who is being addressed by the Apostle John, obviously might have might have been perhaps in advanced age, perhaps he was a bit tired, perhaps he was a great veteran in the truth of God. So that's why the Apostle John said that he prayed that that person may prosper in all things and be in health. So it is at God's express will we see that we've been health for a good reason, because good health is one of the seven laws of success. You might remember the uh, laws of success that Herbert Armstrong wrote a very memorable booklet so one of those seven laws is good health and our health will vitally affect first of all our success in this christian life the degree to which we overcome and grow spiritually and secondly the degree to which we can be used in god's work first of all you know our health will contribute to our, our spiritual growth you see in order for us to use this physical life as god intended to build godly character we need to have the very best health possible because a tired, run-down, sickly body will automatically cause us to have a dull, lethargic mind. In order to have a sharp, clear, alert, sound mind, we must have a healthy, vibrantly alive and physical body. Now, any of us can think you know, more clearly, concentrate better and retain what we learn much more easily if we are in good health, of course. So our spiritual growth, the extent to which God's Spirit can enlighten, inspire and motivate us, will be in direct proportion to the conditions of our health. And secondly, you know, it is our health is important as we are participants in God's work. Because the secondary reason that we should maintain good health is to do God's work. You know, if we are physically run down and weak and at times sick, how can we do our part in the work of God? Whatever that part may be in serving as well as by staying on our jobs to contribute as much as possible to the work. So in order to really produce and be profitable in God's work, we must maintain the best health possible. Now, we need to take a look at the basic keys to good health. Because all of us know that sickness is not normal or natural and that a healthy body is not susceptible to sickness and disease, no matter how many germs it comes in contact with. That's why we, are not, we don't fret because of COVID-19. That's why we are not panicked because of that, you know. But we also need to apply that knowledge, brethren, and accept full responsibility for the present condition of our health. And when we do become sick, we should try to understand what caused it and resolve to change in order to avoid repeating the, that same mistake. Well, we are living in a obviously physically degenerated age, and all of us are now suffering from physical weaknesses, which we either inherited as a result of the physical sins of our forefathers, or which we brought upon ourselves by our former past physical sins or former past lifestyles. Now, rather than using this as an excuse for not maintaining the best possible health, however, we should strive all the harder to negate those weaknesses by complete obedience to the physical laws of health. And there are certain basic keys which, if followed, would ensure that, you know, each of us in our present circumstances will have the best health possible. Now, of course, one of those keys is proper sleep. You know, the first basic key is you know, to staying healthy and being alive, after all, alive, alert, and produ productive is getting regular sleep. You know, our bodies have an inner clock that regulates our metabolism and all our bodily processes. So that this inner clock can function at its optimum level, we need to have a regular pattern of life. And this applies to eating and exercising also, but it especially affects and the benefits we receive from sleep. So the average individual needs about eight hours to sleep beginning and ending at approximately the same time each night to be effective. Now, the human body is not like a machine, you know, it does tire. And during the time we are asleep, our bodily processes slow down and our internal organs rest as well. At the same time, poisons are expelled through the, our sweat glands and the body repairs itself. When we skip sleep or get, at, you know, get it at odd hours, 
We throw additional strain on our bodies, wearing them down, and we upset our metabolism and make our bodies vulnerable to sickness and disease. Also, failure to get you know, proper sleep results in loss of memory. Because this means that our study of God's word is ineffective and our prayers are like a bicycle which stunts our spiritual growth. In addition, we are more accident prone and tend to be more irritable when we have robbed ourselves of needed sleep. So, you know, it's good to set a definite, if possible, of course, reasonably early time each night to go to bed and stick to it. You know, it's good to make it a regular way of life and you'll far be far more alert, alive, healthy and productive. Now, again, I realize I've said this as a principle. We live in a world that, you know, in our case, for example, we have a couple of friends here who, in order to keep the Sabbath, have no choice but to work night shifts. So, you know, obviously their lifestyle is adjusted you know, to that, and uh, they have different patterns of life. So I'm just giving the principles. It's not a dogma, and it's not nobody should feel guilty if, you know, there are times when we simply, you know, by the forces of this life and the circumstances of life, we simply cannot make this uh, a, a, a dogmatic and make it, you know, as as uh, applicable always because you know right now it's like early in the morning here in serbia but you know you might say i do make sacrifice but yes i do it you know intentionally for the sake of god's people and for the sake of their spiritual growth and my spiritual spiritual growth as well so therefore you know those are the various circumstances in which we find ourselves today things have changed we are no longer in you know we're in a different age now than we were before so i'm just giving you when it comes to sleep i just gave you this, the uh, basic principle which of course that basic principle is just the basic principle it's not a dogma but what is more applicable to us will be regular exercise and of course the uh, proper diet regular exercise that's the second basic key to good health because no human being on earth can be in good physical condition without regular exercise. You know, have you ever seen an out of condition deer or squirrel or any kind of animal or a cat or, or, or a goat? You know, their whole way of life of those animals is exercise. So it is normal to be alive, zestful, you know, energized. But many of us have been living in physically straight jacket, you know, physical straight jacket for years. In most cases, simply because we do not get enough exercise. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul wrote this principle for us as well, which says, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. So, in other words, through this verse, God tells us that, you know, for the time we are in this flesh, yet regular exercise is profitable to us. And let us understand why. Well, why? Because our hearts, you know, are designed to pump blood through our bodies and if you know if you're continually inactive many of our arteries and capillaries will dry up and dissipate and your blood will not be able to carry enough oxygen to all parts of your body to keep it full of life and energy as a result you will begin to feel tired all the time and your circulation will become poor in your fingers toes hands and feet at the slightest constriction of circulation they will then begin to tingle and so to speak go to sleep so our heart is a muscle and, you know, any muscle out of condition works inefficiently and produces fatigue, toxins at twice the rate of muscles that are in good condition. Also, in a time of stress, a heart weakened by lack of exercise is vulnerable to a heart attack. Now, drivers involved, you know, in automobile accidents sometimes escape serious injury in the accidents but die of heart attacks, you know. Or there are people who, you know, became refugees and escape terrible warfare and then later die of something bizarre like a heart attack. So this is how a person is literally scared to death. The heart can't take it and just runs away and bursts. Now a heart in good condition cannot run away and it will remain steady after reaching a peak of 180 beats a minute. As this world and this work crashes to a close, brethren, we are going to be under more and more stress and persecution. And we need to be clear about that. We are Philadelphia remnant and we speak the truth as it is. We're not going to be lulling ourselves into, into fairy tales that sadly, you know, various churches of God have been doing to their membership. Just before I started the study, I just saw there's a, another article written by Dr. Bob Thiel about the, once again, restored Church of God and uh, 
they're probably off way to, off the tangent again on some doctrinal or whatever other issue. It's just one example. There are various examples, sadly, in the churches of God. So, you know, we are going to be under most stress and persecution. That's that's the truth. That's what it says in the Bible. So we are going to face crisis after crisis as a church and as individuals. So knowing what we will face in the very near future, all of us should set ourselves to get in top physical shape. Now the best exercises are, you know, depending again on your proclivity. You know, cycling, running, walking and swimming because these exercises not only tone up muscles in our bodies, but they also build up our heart and they increase the circulation of our blood. So when you first begin, so to speak, aerobics, you know, you'll put a load on your muscles and arteries so that your body will begin to produce new arterial clays and for the blood to flow through. And the new strain and flow of life-giving oxygen and blood will clean up the old arteries and expel the poisons. Now the muscles also will become healthy and you know you will lose the feeling of fatigue and your mind will become more much more alert. Now of course it takes persistence stick to it, stick to it, to to that certain certain commitment and character to begin and continue on this regular exercise program but it'll pay off in better health for you today and may save your life in the next few years. At the same time, you know, there are a few of you, some of you who are really already involved in very uh, uh, great exercises. I mean, I really, uh, in a positive way, envy you who picked up six tons of grapes, you know, the six hours. That's beautiful. What a wonderful exercise that is. Uh, those others who are close to such farms and owners of such farms should really make sure that go and volunteer and uh, get themselves more in shape. It's very healthy and beneficial to everyone. So uh, I don't understand that for those of you who have uh, the nature of your work might be really an exercise, which is wonderful. So again, I'm just giving the principle. It's not the dogma. So those of you perhaps who are having farms and certainly who are having farms, you may not need to walk and do cycling or swimming because you're already being very active. Now, the third element that is important for us and our good health is to have peace of mind. And in this crazy horrible world with the headlines which you don't know when you read the headlines you just wonder uh, you know what is next and how worse can our societies deteriorate so the third basic key is that peace of mind we need to develop it you know we need to develop a positive approach to life in spite of all our surroundings you know we shouldn't stew and worry about minor things and we should learn to cast our real concerns worries and burdens on christ you might remember that it says in first peter chapter 5 verse 7 i'm sure you know that verse very well it says casting all your care upon him for he cares for you so it's a condition he cares for you in proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 there is another principle that says that, you know, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit breaks up the body. A merry heart does good like medicine, but broken spirit dries the bones. So if there is no merry heart, you know, there is no peace of mind. If there is worries about everything and anything, especially things beyond our control, we'll just dry our bones. Now, many glands in our body respond to mental stimuli and they react adversely when, uh, with our bodies when we are angry, frustrated, and sorrowful or upset in some way. You know, if we argue, we can't properly digest our food, for example. And many people stimulate fatigue in their bodies by constantly being in a downcast attitude. Second Corinthians chapter 10, we'll read three verses there. Then we'll read three verses in Philippians chapter 4. So Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through five it says for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ so we need this is probably the greatest challenge of all to bring all our thoughts into obedience to christ <laughs> and i don't know who has ever managed to do that and uh, can we at the end, can any of us at the end of the day say oh we made it i'm sure i don't think so so that's why you know it again and again shows us how much we need jesus christ 
And that's certainly the reason I told you many times why twice a year God appointed our total cleansing of all of our sins, you know. So bring, we are in the process, we might say, of bringing our thoughts into obedience to Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Why does it say meditate? Well, because as we meditate on those things, it will generate the peace of mind, brethren. So we should stop worrying about things beyond our control, you know. We need to begin to de-emphasize our problems and exercise faith. And speaking of de-emphasizing problems, try, brethren, to be concerned more about the problems of others. Once you start being concerned about the problems of others, your problems, your own problems will seem much, much, much lesser. Much lesser. Refresh yourself with the promises of God, you know, and clean up your mind through God's word. Really believe and know that all things work together for good to those who love and obey God and with whom he is working to perfect, you know, for his ruling family and kingdom. I often quoted that even when I was in the forum, Romans 8, 28, and we often are reminded of that, which says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We are called to be rulers, rather to be part of the ruling family, into the ruling kingdom of God, and therefore, you know, we are, you know, we, he's working to perfect us. And it's not always an easy process, of course. But in all that process, we need to practice a smile. A cheerful greeting, you know, just radiating happiness and really pursue peace. We don't have to make it artificially, but, you know, we need to pursue peace. And uh, again, as we are exhorting in Philippians, we need to think and meditate on those things that are, you know, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, praiseworthy. It is good that we are be, that we are open, that we talk things out, that we get the problems, misunderstandings and traumas solved quickly. And if we are like that, you know, we will all be surprised if we really begin to practice these things, how much better we will feel and how some of our chronic ailments, pains and fatigues will subside. And then we come to another key, which I'm sure that you're all aware of, uh, and it's called wholesome diet. Now, it's not only concerning the unclean meats and clean meats, but, it, you know, it does concern eating balanced meals, you know. Because there is a saying in English language, we are what we eat. And that's true. And even though we are getting regular sleep and exercise and maintaining peace of mind, unless we are eating properly, we cannot be as healthy as we should be. And this is perhaps the most important basic key to good health, you know. Because we should eat a wholesome, well-prepared, well-balanced diet. Sometimes, yes, I know, we are sometimes lazy and we don't feel like it. But uh, vegetables and fruits should predominate unspoiled by injurious dressings and sauces and i really wonder sometimes forgive me i know i'll offend many if i say this but to me ketchup is one of the uh, least needed inventions of the which century 21st or 20th century i don't really understand that we used to have you know freshly squeezed you know tomato juice from when when i was when i was a child and our grandmothers would make it and our mothers used to make it but nowadays we just have all kinds of dressings and sauces and things that are just they're just interesting and irrelevant and you know vegetables and fruit of course should be the major portion of our diet certainly but next in importance should be of course should come protein because you know proteins the sources of proteins are good lean meats fresh raw milk butter eggs and cheese and last should come, of course, carbohydrates sparingly, whole grains and potatoes chiefly. So then we also need, as we all know, to drink plenty of fresh, clean water daily. And those parts of the world that do not have plenty of, you know, or, or at all, clean and fresh water, that should be the priority, brethren. You know, the priority in those parts of the world, you know, which parts I'm talking about, those brethren who live in those parts of the world, the main, the first priority should be the day get clean fresh water that's the first priority of all not the building buildings church buildings whatever but the clean fresh water is a must and we need to ensure 
if we're able to, we need to ensure that they get that first of all. Now, most people emphasize these things in just the reverse order, you know. The major part of their diet consists of sugars and starches, followed heavily by protein. Then they rarely eat green leafy vegetables and occasionally have an apple or orange. And some drink virtually no water at all. I've been, and, and Serbia nation is one of the leading nations that doesn't drink water almost at all. Yes, the awareness of the need to drink water has been raised in the last several days, several days and several months and several years. But the Serbian, if there is one thing that the Serbian nation drinks, it's coffee. It's coffee, plenty of coffee, but water rarely is. You can see rarely people mentioning water and stuff. Some people are becoming more conscious about it, but many are still lacking. And every year I keep warning my kinsmen that because of lack of drinking, lack of, you know, their, their failure to drink enough water, that they'll get ill, especially in the winter time. You know, in summertime, they're at least forced to drink some drinks, which are not water, but even water. But, you know, in the, in the winter time, in winter time, it's amazing how people get ill simply because they do not drink enough water. Anyway, it takes more effort, of course, to prepare a nourishing wholesome meal. I understand that. And it's easier to just, you know, get pre-cooked, pre-packaged food than to take the time to bake your own bread, prepare nourishing, colorful salads, carefully wash green leafy vegetables and wash them closely, you know, to in ensure that they cook slowly but are not overcooked or burned. Starchy vegetables and products take virtually no effort on our part to prepare and cook. And we should not be lazy to make the effort to ensure a healthful, nourishing diet for our families and for ourselves, of course. In then the chapter 1, we won't be reading that, but it's uh, section verses 4 through 16. I'm sure you remember the section, what the section was all about. But Daniel was healthy and he wanted to stay that way. You know, he didn't intend to defile his body and sludge up his mind with the rich, starchy, spiced up concoctions the king of Babylon was eating. But, you know, he was not a vegetarian, by the way, and he drank wine. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 3, you'll find that he drank wine. I'm emphasizing this because, of course, the Adventists mostly use Daniel and uh, the writings of Daniel to propagate vegetarianism and say that Daniel was a vegetarian. You know, they would take this section 4 through 16, which does mention lentils, for example, and they would just uh, say it's very healthy for your diet. It's indeed true. And then, but then they would say, you see, Daniel was vegetarian because no meat is mentioned. And of course, they are against wine. No, Daniel drank wine. Daniel was a Jew. Jewish people have always drank wine. If wine was sin and against the Torah, the moral law of the Bible, the Jewish people, who are very, those at least observant Jewish people, would have never drank wine. But in all these sections across the Ju Judaism, across Judaism, across the Jewish world, from Orthodox to conservatives to liberals, liberal Jews, all of them drink wine, even the most Orthodox ones. They drink wine, brethren, because wine is not forbidden by the Bible. So Daniel also drank wine, Daniel chapter 10, verse 3. It's another proof you can always, you know, pull up and say to the Adventists, no, you have it wrong. They will not accept it, of course, but still... We need to feel you. We need to make sure that we know that we are right. So Daniel simply ate natural vegetables and fruits, and later in life, of course, he ate clean, unadulterated meats and good natural, unfortified, unmixed wines. And we would do well to follow his good example in this. Now, when it comes to diet, we are to avoid preservatives and artificial colorings and flavorings and supplements. You know, brethren, we should avoid knowingly. Again, I'm speaking about principles. I'm not saying that. Sometimes we are not going to be cheated, you know, or perhaps unwittingly, unknowingly, we, we may just make mistakes. That's another stuff. You know, here in Serbia, we have a problem because we are a bread eating, bread consuming, bread devouring nation, as no nation on the face of the earth is. And sometimes we don't really know in certain bakeries, you know, I'm sure in my town, in the bakery where I buy bread, yeah, it's all, you know, the bread is being baked on, on oil. But many people here, Many people in my town use lard instead of cooking oil because lard seems to be, I guess it's cheaper or, or they're just used to it. But you know, there are some bakeries, even though they say they use a cooking oil because lard is cheaper, they would use lard. You know, I, I, I learned about that by an accident when I lived in the north of the country. So then I chose a bakery that was kept by the 
uh, by the people who for sure were baking on the cooking oil and uh, ever since then I went to that bakery here in my town yes the bakery that we are using indeed it is uh, the bread is baked on the cooking oil so you see but you know sometimes you if you're hungry you want to go to a bakery you sometimes don't really know uh, whether they really use the cooking oil as they should or that they cheated if they cheated their customers we don't know that and we are not to be overly concerned about the brethren to the point of death you know if it's a matter of life and death we are to be concerned about life so again i'm giving you the principles so we should avoid knowingly eating foods with preservatives and or artificial coloring or fa flavoring because people today are suffering from unheard of diseases and paying a horrible penalty in their bodies largely due to these factors by themselves because you know these things are out and out poisons in most cases and are very harmful to make matters worse many of them are residual so they accumulate in our systems polluting our bodies constantly and building up for a grand final knockout blow so it is a simple matter to check the things we buy for preservatives you know all products more or less list their contents or at least they're in your western world in our world is here is still not the case so but however god holds us responsible for what we know where we have the choice for just being a little careful and not buying these things so again i'm talking about principles i'm not accusing anybody of anything please don't get this personal we're talking about principles brethren and again you know if unknowingly sometimes you know there, there are people who are unknow unknowingly unknowingly unknown to us it didn't happen to me but it ha did happen to some other believers they would just serve them pork and would not tell them it's pork you know and then they would afterward they would laugh ha 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 you ate pork and stuff but you know the, the conscience your conscience in that case is clear you didn't do things intentionally so again god looks on the intention of our hearts and motives brethren we're not to be you know to be like having a, a, a dogmatic stuff about uh, righteous uh, in, in a way that how, how do i mean dogmatic i mean dogmatic if it happened that you unwittingly ate something that you shouldn't oh that's a horrible sin you'll be burning in the lake of fire of course not we're speaking about being conscious and you know doing our best to ensure that our diet is wholesome now again if you're visiting someone's home and you don't know whether or not what they serve contains such things well simply ask god's blessing on it and purification of the food and trust god and the same is with all the food that we have brother why do we always ask ask the bless ask for the blessings and uh, invoke blessings upon the food well because we don't really know in the process of uh, manufacturing or whatever other factors might have come in and played the played the role in in in, in perhaps polluting food or perhaps there might be something harmful there we are praying so that you know god will just purify that food and we trust him so don't worry about it you know if you're in someone's home just pray and don't worry about it but where but where you are doing the buying and it is your decision well then god holds you and me responsible to do the best you can and only buy that which is wholesome and nutritious herbert armstrong used to come constantly state that we should eat only those natural foods that will spoil and eat them before they do spoil so this is a very good overall principle to follow with regard to every area of our diet and if you see that you know part of a potato is rotten or part of your onion that you bought is rotten that's a good sign brother that's a good sign that's a healthy food you know the food that can last for i don't know three months six months but something is wrong with that isn't it strictly avoid artificial supplements and vitamins as well as food enriched so-called enriched or fortified so-called fortified with such supplements brethren a balanced diet of natural wholesome food is the surest quickest best way to health and many of these under quotation mark health foods pills and vitamins are very harmful they get your body out of balance or react adversely for example iron supplements often take the animal of your teeth vitamin d during pregnancy can cause mental retardation of your unborn child as well as heart and bone defects vitamin k can cause jaundice etc 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 brethren god gave us dr bob thiel he is a doctor of natural medicine and his health food supplements are available so we have a reliable source and a great blessing for all of us 
He rarely speaks about who he is and what is his profession, but that's what he is. And he rarely speaks about, you know, his company that does produce food supplements. So please, let us not rely on the world, satanic world around us. God has given us, in his very government, on the top of his church, a leader of a Philadelphia remnant, he has given us the greatest blessings we could ask for. Yes, I understand that, you know, balanced diet even today. I mean, the, the, the soil is so uh, exploited and, and, and polluted. I understand that, you know, uh, pollution of the air is there. I understand that the uh, things that we have today, like apples and grapes and stuff, I mean, they contain far less nutritious elements than 50 or 100 years ago. Yes, I understand that. Dr. Thiel is also aware of that. And that is why his company produces the top quality, the best quality food supplements, brethren. And we should not be ashamed of saying that and using that. So please, please do not rely on this world for the food supplements. No, you know, contact Dr. Thiel if you need to or take a look at what he offers and use those things. Take advantage of that. God has blessed us in this end and times at least with the fact at least with the reliable godly source of uh, food supplements and there is no need for any of us to be relying on the world and these health foods and rich fortified supplements whatever there is no need for us to rely on that when we have the when we have the person our leader who has ensured that we have true, real, good food supplements. Speaking of diet, brethren, one of those things that we need to do, if possible, of course, that's again the principle. Sometimes unknowingly we may just fail, but totally eliminate all refined and processed foods. And when I say that I'm among the first ones to be guilty of still, I'm still kind of very much fond of mayonnaise you know and uh, it's my problem you see but i intend for one you know, when i moved to this town I, for a year i held out against mayonnaise but then i gave up after a while because you know they go it goes well with french fries and so on but i intend to give up on that again and i will because i keep telling myself there are butter there are other dairy products in this part of the world and you should you know of all the people in the world you should not be eating mayonnaise anyway so totally eliminate so it's a challenge i know it's something we're working on so avoid the starchy greasy sugary spiced up concoctions that may taste good at the moment but which contain little nutritional value and will supply simply clog up your system and wreck your stomach and health in time virtually all of us know the great harm that is caused by such refined, so-called refined, or so-called improved products as white bread, white sugar, canned fruits and vegetables, and pasteurized milk. You know, when this type of food is fed to rats and dogs, they became, they became, you know, during the experiments, cowardly at first, then go out of their minds and ultimately die of starvation. So keep that in mind. Now, we have all, we around the world have all with horrors have seen those huge, humongous, terribly obese, okay, I won't use the word fat because it may not be politically correct, but that's the right word, obese people in America. And you have seen them as well on TV, I hope. I hope that you don't have any church, any, any uh, family members. But I mentioned church members. I, I do have some friends in other groups and sometimes I you know watch their live services and I was always very concerned, so to speak. Well, no, that's understatement. I was very horrified to see how obese they are. Unhealthy obese. Brethren, American nation is particularly vulnerable because I don't know what they're putting in your food. When I was in a, a student in America, you know, I, I gained plenty of weight. I like gained in my first, in my freshman year, I gained 12 kilograms, which is amazing. I don't know what they do, how they refined and so-called improve the food products, but something is wrong there. So American nation is now paying the penalty of having generations grow up on refined and processed non-foods rather than on wholesome nutritional foods. 
Keep that in mind. These refined and processed foods are not only definitely detrimental physically, as we can see on TV, but they are detrimental mentally. And please, having said that, did you know that in Psalm 104, verse 15, there is something that speaks about bread, speaking of bread. Now, this is very important for the Serbian nation, again, because you don't really know the amount of bread consumed on a daily basis here in Serbia, brethren. You, don't, you, you have no idea until one day, hopefully, you will come and see it yourselves. Psalm 104, verse 15. And wine that makes glad the heart of man. So again, there is wine that Daniel drank, you know, uh, unpolluted wine. Oil to make his face shine. And bread which strengthens man's heart. <laughs> bread which strengthens man's heart. Isn't that interesting? Now, of course, in the Middle Eastern culture, the bread was also, you know, the Jewish people ate bread. Remember, breaking the bread, that was the uh, symbolical language for a meal, as you know. It wasn't the Eucharist, as people, people in the West, you know, uh, interpret that because they don't understand that, you know, a nation like the Jewish nation could break bread and eat breads, you know, loaves of breads. So, God gives humankind bread which strengthens the heart, gives us courage, stamina and health. You know, the nutrients in natural whole grains do just that. But man, what does man do? Man improves, under quotation mark, improves the natural grains and destroys his mind and body. Where are men of courage and conviction in our nations today, brethren? They plead for peace and decry the riots and violence in the streets, but they do not have the courage or the will to do anything to solve the problems, to stand up for decency and order. So... Did you know that bread is mentioned in the Bible? Yes, here it is, Psalm 104, verse 15. Keep that in mind. Next time that you're choosing bread or pastry, whatever, keep in mind this verse. Because hospitals in America and elsewhere in the world are filled with people with mental disorders and our streets and homes abound with them. Tooth decay affects so many and our nations are wrecked with unheard of sicknesses and diseases that are the direct result of diet of processed and refined foods. And let me mention those desserts. Yes, I know we all kind of love them. Brethren, desserts made with refined ingredients are a big offender among God's people. Most of what is palmed off as dessert today is totally unfit for human consumption. So if all possible, make some home desserts, home sweets. Yes, I'm not against desserts. Don't get me wrong. Just before the study, we ate the poppy seed, poppy seed pie, which each one of us here ate one piece of that it's a beautiful stuff with milk it's fantastic but brethren sadly in the west there is so much lack of uh, recipes for good and tasty and somewhat healthy desserts let alone that there is a lack of other recipes in all spheres of life well you need in the west speaking of the west you can rely on the french cuisine which is brilliant and you have us here in Serbia, we have been under the influence of all kinds of cuisines from the east to the west, from the south to the north. So we have implemented in our diet both French recipes and Turkish recipes and Oriental recipes and this and that and the other. And we can always give you some very useful advices how to make healthy, healthy and, and, and tasty stuff. And so can French. So anyway, you know... Desserts, brethren, desserts are not necessary after every evening meal. And on special occasions when you have dessert, well, try to serve fruit or nuts or be sure that the dessert is made wholly with natural ingredients. It is possible. We get it here from the bakery, though. You know, I'm not a skillful cook, nevertheless, but yeah, we sometimes experiment here at home. Nevertheless, we have a good bakery and they make those very, you know, wholly with natural ingredients, wholly desserts. Now, if you are visiting and are offered a dessert that you know is not good food, well, you can easily turn it down without offending your host or making an issue of it. You shouldn't ever, you should never make issue of it. Of it. You know, simply decline the dessert, and if pressed, you can just graciously say that you have already had enough, of, or that you have learned from bitter experience that that type of thing just has an adverse effect on your system, and that will be that will be fine. But then again, again, don't feel offended when I say that. You, People in the West do have a lack of recipes for good dessert. I mean, one of the most unhealthy desserts I've ever seen in my life were those in England. Made from such artificial stuff that cream was just, 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 just 
you know, taste so artificial, taste so awful. And there's, you know, there's nothing wrong to consult other cultures and other cuisines, cuisines and, impl uh, and apply and implement what they do in your, you know, in your own food preparation. There is nothing wrong with that, brethren. Not at all. And it should be done. Remember how I gave you that way the spinach recipe, which turned out to be the same recipe that the French use as well, that we here use as well. And, you know, I gave it to you so that, you know, you can make a tasty spinach that your your children and yourself would eat with with stamina and with zeal and with joy and with with, with pleasure not you know having just having just boil leaves and, and put some some salt on it and you think oh this is going to be tasty no it won't be you know of course the the food being prepared needs to be tasty as well because who is going to eat and who is going to enjoy a meal and how can we say to God, thank you for giving us this meal if it's if we are if we're not going to enjoy it at all? So we need to stop also compromising with what we knew. And when I say that, that's the first accusation with me because I mentioned to you my mayonnaise, love for mayonnaise, processed mayonnaise. There is a homemade mayonnaise, and I should, one of these days I should try to make my own. And there's also mayonnaise you can make from soy mayonnaise, for example, which is you know not which is very tasty i tasted it at somebody's place and it's not as unhealthy in fact it's very healthy as well so we should stop compromising it's a battle again so let's make sure we just uh, engage in that battle and stop compromising with what we know to do because by being in god's church for years most of us already know how you know many of these basic keys to good health but you know are we acting on that knowledge well far too many in god's church are constantly sick brethren weak and physically degenerate thick-headed thick-bodied and poisoned thousands of god's people and i say god's people i mean all the churches of god thousands of god's people have only enough energy after dinner to stagger to the tv and sit in a stupor and watch it that's tragic in most cases you know it is not lack of knowledge it is simply a lack of the character to do what they know is right just how much sin do we permit ourselves and what excuse do we use you see we people in the world and also others in the church losing sleep burning the candle at both ends too busy to get regular exercise and eating junk as we and we may conclude oh well it doesn't seem to affect them too adversely I, it won't hurt me any worse than it hurts them you know, we may also look, uh, you know, to someone else and justify what they do because so-and-so does it. That, in other words, makes it all right in spite of what we personally know is right. Well, you know, God doesn't reason that way. He holds each of us responsible for doing what we know to do. But still we might think, well, look, we have only got a few more years in this physical flesh. It doesn't matter that much. We'll make it. Well, brethren, but it does matter. And with that attitude, we may very well not make it. We may also reason that the good things we eat make up for those bad things we also eat, not seeming to realize that such abominations not only lack nutritional value, but they're in effect poisons to our system. When we reason this, you know, this way, we often feel that just because we have changed our diet in one or two ways, perhaps starting to eat whole wheat bread and drink raw milk, that we are now eating God's well. Well, no, we have just barely made a start in that direction. We need to be aware of that. But many, when they are given knowledge on specific items, reject that knowledge. And I've heard from some of you and I've heard from other friends you know, potluck in church, potluck. And uh, some people bring very healthy, great stuff like figs. And then there's plenty, mind you, church, potluck, and plenty of those, let's call them foods. Those so-called foods are devoured almost immediately. And uh, those people who brought healthy stuff usually return them home. That is so tragic. That is That is so sad. And it's a lack of character on the part of the churches and the congregations, you know, lack of their character to redirect their interest to what and their uh, zeal to what is healthy and good for their bodies. 
So, yes, many when they're given knowledge of specific items, they reject that knowledge better. They're slaves, their own lusts, their own sweet tooth, and just can't bring themselves to give up that which is sludging up their bodies and ruining their health. They toss off Romans 14, 17, you know, to justify their continuance of the defiling of their bodies. With, you know, with comment, oh, well, let's not get buggy. Remember, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Well, brethren, Romans 14, 17 has to do with offending a weak brother who is a vegetarian by, by your liberty of eating meat. It gives no one any justification whatsoever for not changing abominable eating habits. So we need to be aware of that. Now, God's church will never begin. You know, somebody say, well, if God's church doesn't say, wait a second, brethren, God's church will never begin to legislate on any food other than unclean food. Because it is not the purpose of God's church to give a series of do's and don'ts in regard to diet or any other area of your lives. The church can only explain the principles. It is then up to the individual to build character by applying that knowledge. Just like, forgive me if I am boring with that, but I was thinking today about it. Just like the church explained the principles of self-defense and that we are not to bear arms, that we are to live by faith, and live in faith that God will protect our homes. Now, I was wondering today as I was thinking about those who are resisting those principles. You know, we're not going to make them. We cannot make them give up arms. No, we cannot. But they've heard the principles. And I was wondering what will happen tomorrow when they'll have to leave their homes and go into a war and torn part of the world on the way to the place of safety. If they don't trust God now regardless of the societal issues, and I understand that we live in an evil world, but if they don't trust God now to protect, protect their homes and them, then how much less faith they're going to have when they will have to leave and embark to go to a worn, torn part of the world on the way to the place of safety, brethren, I wonder. Will they have faith for that? Which leads me to another conclusion. Yes, we're a Philadelphia remnant, but we, you know, even though Philadelphia is promised the place of safety, will all of those who claim to be part of the continuing church of God go into the place of safety? Well, with such an attitude and lack of faith, obviously not. So again, the church is not here to, and the government of God is not here to give you a series of do's and don'ts like a halakha or, or Jewish list of do's and don'ts, brethren. No. In regard to any area of your life, the church is not going to do that. You know, the church can only explain the principles. And then it is up to all individual members to build character by applying that knowledge and stepping out on faith to also apply that knowledge. But nobody can make you do it. And nobody will make you do it. And nobody will even attempt to make you do it. So let's quit, you know, kidding ourselves. Let's stop playing little games to justify our rotten diets and hideous, hideous eating habits. Because God holds each of us responsible for doing the very best we can to find out what constitutes proper nutrition and changing our diets to conform to that knowledge to ensure good health, stamina, endurance and resistance to disease. And then if through our human weakness, of course we sin, as we all do from time to time, well, he is merciful to forgive us and heal us through Jesus Christ. But he will neither condone our compromise and willful disobedience, nor heal us when we continue to justify ourselves and refuse to do what we know we should. Now, those physical sins, you know, eating, yeah, it's a physical thing, can be also spiritual sin, because there is an expression to the effect that a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Well, <coughs> much knowledge can also be dangerous if we are not acting on and obeying that knowledge james chapter 4 verse 17 james 4 verse 17 therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin brethren this is the very heart and core of the reason that so many when i say so many again i'm speaking in the context of the entire churches of god that so many are constantly sick in God's church. 
And it is amazing that, you know, the prayer requests are just abundant in the churches of God, of all the people of the face of the earth. The prayer requests we should be having for accidents or for other things, but, you know, for illness, brethren, that are caused by bad nutrition of all the people, what kind of witness are we giving to the world? So this James 4.17 is the very heart and core of the reason that so many are constantly, mark what I said, constantly sick in God's church. And why so many of those sick are just not healed when they're anointed, but have to, you know, tough it out. Why? Well, brethren, because many claim to repent of the physical sins that cause the illness, but continue to do the same things that cause it. They will not change, yet they know better. They'll continue to drink those soft drinks, which are just horrendous. They'll continue to eat those bad stuff that they call food, and they just wouldn't change their habits. And still others toss it off as attributable solely to the fact that this is the end time, and we are all so degenerate it couldn't have been avoided. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It could not be avoided, really. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap, will of the flesh reap corruption. You may add sickness, suffering. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Well, you see, brethren, healing is the forgiveness of physical sins, physical body indeed, we can't mock God. We can, you know, we cannot claim to repent and continue to repeat the same mistakes that caused the illnesses, knowing better and expect God to heal us. I mean, if you know a particular so-called food is not good for you and you eat it anyway, well, you're committing sin. And the thing you ate was harmful to your physical body. And the fact that you did it anyway, knowingly, was lust, which caused you to weaken your spiritual character. Let's read three passages in the Bible. Colossians in chapter Colossians chapter 3, in 1 John chapter 3 as well, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 25. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. In other words, we are going to pay a penalty for both sins. You know, the more we compromise in this way, the more we lose both character and faith. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So we cannot go wholeheartedly to God in faith for healing when we know we haven't been doing the best we can with the knowledge we have. When we know we have been compromising continually with that which makes for good health, you know. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 well-known verse to us, it says, Or do you not know that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So the question is, do we understand? Can we grasp that we are the temple of God's Holy Spirit? For those of us who know and understand what physical sin is and the penalty that Christ willingly accepted in our place so that we can be healed, we cannot shrug off it, you know, or take lightly physical sin with some trite excuse. God doesn't shrug off or take lightly physical sin, you know. He allowed his son's body to be utterly broken so that those physical sins could be removed and our bodies healed. Remember, by his stripes we are healed. Why do we break the bread, the unleavened bread, on every Passover ceremony, brethren? Because his body was broken, tortured beyond imagination. Why? So that by his stripes we will be healed. But how are we going to be healed and trust for healing and go to God wholeheartedly for healing if we just keep eating what is not edible? So our health was and is that important to God, that he, you know, allowed his son's body to be utterly broken so that those physical sins could be removed and our bodies healed. Now, of course, when I say physical sin, I mean sins that we commit by physical act, you know. You know, of course, that physical sin cannot be really uh, delineated into spiritual and physical. All sin is sin. But yes, there are physical acts that lead to sin. There are also 
so to speak, spiritual acts like thoughts that also lead to sin. In that way, I mean. So we cannot say, oh, physical things. We are spiritual, so physical thing that we do, it's not really, it doesn't really matter. Well, it does. So we need to resolve. Let's go to Psalm 91. We need to resolve, you know, to build good health and also good character. Psalm 91, I'm sure that when I say that, you have remembered that we had a sermon about Psalm 91. Yes, it's the place of safety psalm and speaks about, you know, protecting us. But look what it says in verses 2 and 3. I'll say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. Verse 3, surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Verse 9 and 10, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. So, don't sell this area of your life short, brethren. If we are to withstand the plagues and disease epidemics that are increasingly coming upon the Anglo-Saxon nations, we must first do our part and then trust God for the rest. Thankfully, Almost none of us have been con have been diagnosed with COVID, and those who have, it was very mild anyway. Why? Because I believe it's because our immune system is good, and because I believe we are indeed following God's principles. As far as I know, uh, as far as I have seen uh, in the continuing Church of God, at least there is a very strong awareness of uh, of the need to practice good health, and I'm very pleased with that. And I'm, I'm sure that God is even more pleased with that. As much as He is not pleased with those who are rambling against, uh, rambling about, you know, Azazel Goat and rambling about, rambling about have, wanting to have guns and their own defense and rambling about other things. When it comes to food and diet, I'm, uh, we are very strong in that area. I've seen a very strong commitment. I've, I've seen uh, a, a very good and high awareness of that. And I want us to continue that way. And hopefully, in all these other areas that we are not yet perfect, we will hopefully uh, reach that high level of uh, of near complete perfection, so to speak. So, yes, we are on a very good way. I know we practice very good diets all over the world. So don't sell you know this area of our lives short. If we are to withstand those plagues, we need to continue. You know, we need to be healthy, energetic, filled with life, and have sharp, clear minds in order to really grow spiritually. And we need to be physically strong and full of you know, zeal, zest, energy to help finish this work. But just as important also, we need to use this area of our lives to build character, not tear it down. So resolve not to compromise your conscience in any of the basic keys which would ensure good health. Resolve you know, that by the way we conduct this area of our lives, we will build good health and also good character.